Happy new comic book day geeks and welcome to issue 37 of the Script Heroes podcast. The show where we bring you comic news, book reviews, and industry blues. My name is Joseph Jasonowski and I am the writer of Gender Hero, Cunning Carly, and the Cryptoverse. And I'm Katie Markham, scripter of the Rust Robot Country Club and Ghost Raider Extraordinaire. We've got some wonderful polls for you this week. A little, a little, uh, half and a half you. We've got a couple from last week that we, we've got copies of now and a couple from yep. this week. We are running through Winnie the Pooh Demon Hunter, number two from friend of the pod, Nicholas Mueller, and The Pedestrian, as well as Kardak the Mystic and our much anticipated Heart Piercer number four. But uh, if you enjoy any of those polls or anything else you see on today's episode, you can follow the pod on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, all at the handle Script Heroes Pod. Or you can find me personally on all the same socials at JJAZ1111. Or me at Katie Markham Pro. And now, let's move on to the news. Okay, so we only have one bit of news this week because I have a feeling Katie's going to want to talk about this for quite some time. Oh dear. Um, We have a piece of news regarding one of Katie's favorite comic book characters. Um, And I'm interested, I want you to take a a, a guess at, um, should I, do you want the creative team? It's a new DC uh, miniseries. And I want to know if you want the creative team before you try to guess. Uh, what well, character this is for the fact that I was stroking various Nightwings and you said nothing, that it's not a Nightwing thing. Um, it's not a Nightwing thing. I would have said your favorite instead of it, one I was of your say, It would have been bold to say one of as he's got a yeah, yeah, yeah. shrine here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would love the creative team before I try to guess. Okay, it's Tom King and Ryan Sook. Oh, I swear I saw that Tom King was working on something. Shit! I almost he had saw been using that he was working on something without like revealing what it was for a little while mm. before it got announced a day or two ago. So there's a chance that you saw it before the book was actually there, but maybe you did see it with the character and you're just forgetting. Oh uh, no, I think I saw it on League of Comic Geeks. Ah, oh, I'm, like stressing my brain so hard. <laughs> this is worse than if I knew that I didn't know. <laughs> Come on, one of your favorite characters. You can do this. Is it Ted Cord? No, that's a good <sighs> guess, though. That's a good guess, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was like a Ted Cord thing. I think it'd be it's a not. better guess if I he might be dead in current continuity. Actually, I think he died in Jaime Reyes's Blue Beetle book. That that tracks. So um, that does make it a slightly less good guess. Um, yeah. Oh, geez, my own favorite characters. Uh, they give him a lot of women. Is it Batwoman? No, but you're on the right track with, oh. with the woman thing, not with the no. not with particularly Batwoman. Because <laughs> I was like, we have a secondary, you know, shrine in yeah. the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. It's a woman. I like most of the DC women. Um, <laughs> I don't think they would give him a Poison Ivy book right now because she just came off her long run. I don't think that you would call Catwoman one of my favorite DC characters. I would not. I would not. Um, and you said it's not a bat. It's not a bat. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay, going through my mental list with the Titans. I don't think it'd be a Raven one. Uh, oh, you you smiled a little bit. Is it a Raven book? <laughs> it's not a Raven book. Okay. I smiled because you started going down the wrong track. Oh, no, the wrong track. <laughs> Should I be going down a villainous track? I feel like Tom King no, is a normally big villainous track. Is it you should Zatanna? be going down a Titans track. No, no, no. That's oh, a solid God. guess. Damn it. But I think you like this character more than Zatanna. Oh, um, no. I'm really just like egg all over my own face. This right might now. be, unless unless I'm I'm wildly off base. I think this is your, probably your favorite non bat adjacent character. Oh, my God. Oh, no. And I can't think of her. Why am I. I think. I think. Maybe You're I'm probably off base. right. I think so though because it comes one to... of the characters you talk to me the most about <laughs> despite being a character that i read very little of okay you said very little at least not, solo no. stuff from this so character i was I thinking it could of. be but supergirl since he did woman of tomorrow stuff. is it supergirl he did woman it's of not tomorrow supergirl. okay it's not super um <laughs> who do i talk about oh no pivot to another family pivot to another pivot family to another not the big two pivot to another family um, a family that I read enough of that I get this character a lot in overlap. 
I... Oh, right I'm a dumbass. It's Black Canary. It's Black Canary. <laughs> there you go. I was just like, who are all of the women I love? <laughs> no, that is so such you a fair details? <laughs> Yes, please give me details. Okay, so the miniseries is going to be called The Best of the Best uh, by, like I said before, Tom King and Ryan Sook. And uh, here's the little description. Black Canary faces her toughest opponent yet, Lady Shiva, in a <gasps> battle to determine who is the greatest hand-to-hand -hand fighter in the DC universe. To make it to the final round, Black Canary will need all of her fighting skill and ability, plus additional training from some of DC's most accomplished fighters, including Batman, Wildcat, and even her mother, the original Black Canary. Okay, that sounds pretty exciting. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, like, she's been very well written in the Green Arrow series. Like, it's been fun to read her relationships with people there. Because Joshua Williamson, again, great at writing character relationships. Absolutely. But I've been a little like, okay, she's she's kind of not getting to really do her thing, though. Because it was a little crowded in the Green Arrow book. Well, she's in the Birds of Prey book, too, right? I was about like, to say, and Birds yeah. of Prey, I've been meaning to give a second chance because we started reading it. We're both like, eh. Uh, but I've heard so many wonderful things about it. But I also heard so many wonderful things about Tom King's Wonder Woman and then gave it a second chance and was like, eh. Uh, so I don't know if I trust the, the you know, faceless mass. The mass horde. Yes. <laughs> the mass online horde, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so no, this is super thrilling to me. Because uh, I'm pretty hit or miss with Tom King's stuff. But I really love Thanks. Woman of Tomorrow, which is, I think, the last time he did... Like a, a, you know, kind of, I guess, I think that was after Human Target. Or it might have I been. Because uh, I didn't was, love I Human like Target. around the same time. But you might be right. Woman of Tomorrow might be like a year after Human Target or somewhere in that. They're both in the same, like, relative yeah, time yeah. space. They're and not, I also have like, really been far loving far. his series Helen of Windhorn right now. So, like, I feel like he weirdly does a pretty good job for the most part. But it's like, here's my... Limited series about a cool woman. Uh, <laughs> uh, and are you familiar with Ryan Sook's uh, work think, at all? I think so. Does he do like the really light line work with a lot of lines on the faces? Because I love... I think so so the, one, the thing that I'm familiar with that he did, and we actually read it together for our Rebirth crazy long episode of All the Rebirths, he did yes. the Batman Beyond uh, Rebirth. Uh, one Ooh. shot, which if I remember correctly, you quite enjoyed, as I did I, obviously. I sure did. I'm, I'm like uh, scrolling so, through. He does a lot of, uh, like, covers. Mm -hmm. Like, there was a lot more when I was looking at covers compared to, like, once I started looking at, uh, you know, books that uh, he actually did the interior work on. Um, but there's, like, there, there's oh, a lot. Oh, he did Blue and Gold. Amazing. We love Booster and Beetle. No, this is this. <laughs> I, is I, I was shocked that you you guessed uh, Blue Beetle and then you didn't immediately go to Booster Gold after that. Um, that's fair. That's fair. I feel like you would have given me more of a I uh, more yeah. of a, a hint if I was that. Yeah, close. but that, that's why I was like, I was like, you know, I feel like Booster Gold would have made even more sense in like the the Tom King likes him and he's not dead. So you know, <laughs> look, I forgot Ted was dead. Okay. <laughs> Ted has been dead like multiple times. Like they Ted exactly. Is just, uh, it's hard to keep track of when dead he's dead boy. and when he's not. That's true. That's very fair. Yeah. Um, I I, I retract my statement. But in any <laughs> case, we got a cool uh, Black Canary series that we might we might yeah. try to take tackle on the the pod here because that could be that could be fun. Certainly issue one. Um, yeah, certainly we'll issue. Yeah, uh, we'll see how it goes from there. So, Mr. King, Absolutely. don't disappoint us. <laughs> yep, I, I I'm I'm very excited because it seems like uh. This could be really cool. The the little blurb, you seem very excited about the blurb. I think the blurb sounds pretty cool. Lady Shiva's a, a frequently Shiva. underutilized DC uh, villain. So I am curious about... Because <laughs> it's like, oh, she goes to train with a bunch of people as well. And I'm like, okay, so are they like, meet me up by the bike racks? We'll fight in two months? <laughs> Which honestly does sound like a Lady Shiva move. <laughs> I'm guessing some sort of like trial by combat or type. Like it does sound Probably. like she's gonna. It's gonna be like a set thing, and she's gonna yeah. have like time to prepare. My guess. For, did they say it's a four issue mini? No, I guess they just said mini. My my brain immediately went to four issue with like 
Batman, Wildcat, and her mother each getting an issue, and then the the fight in the fourth issue. Well, I would issue. think that would probably that be five, because I'm sure there would be a setup issue as well. There could be a setup issue, And I don't issue, think DC too. normally That's does fair. five, so it's probably a six. I bet they're, like, it's hiding someone It's weird they only named six, like, th- maybe there's just, they haven't revealed who a couple of the other people she'll be training with are yet. But you're right, DC does usually do six, but that's why I went to, like, four instead, because I was like, I could sooner see DC dropping a four than, like, doing five, because five's, right. like, the Marvel number, and exactly. they don't do the Marvel They can't number. look like Marvel? What, are they no, both making no. comic books? Well, you know, after the whole QR code thing, I don't blame <laughs> DC. You don't, you don't, you don't want to be lumped into that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, rock and I was very excited to tell you about this because I know that you've probably been hurting for a Black Canary series for a little bit now. So, and I realized it wasn't that I saw a Tom King book on League of Comic Geeks. It was definitely a Greg Smallwood one. He's doing something coming up for DC. I don't remember mm-hmm. what, uh, but he's the artist from Human Target. Yes, yes, yes. Which is why you would, you know, be they're the same conflated. person, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In any case. Let's move on to the books that we're actually going to be talking about this week um, in the Pull List Rec. Let's do it! All right, here we are in the Pull List Rec. We've got four books to look at this week. We've got Winnie the Pooh, Demon Hunter, oh, The Pedestrian. She went in the complete wrong order for me. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Karnak the Mystic and Heart Piercer. But of course, that's not all we picked up this week. Jaybird. No, it's not. What else did you yes. get? I got a few other things, including a book that we we had started reading on the pod, but due to our, you know, long times off and stuff, we kind of dropped it for the pod, but I'm not dropping it for myself. Falling in Love on the Path to Hell, number three. Um, Very cool book that I didn't know came out this week. I have number two. I've not read number two yet. Um, No, I did read number two. I I read number two when we were going to be covering it. I did read number two. Yes. Did you like it? Number two was quite cool. Yeah, it's quite cool. Uh, The plot didn't move kind of as much for it as I was hoping, but Ooh. it set up some stuff that I'm, I'm excited for in issue three, but I did forget about that for a second. Well, I'm excited to hear your thoughts to figure out if I should like go back and read all of it. I think it's worth it. It's worth it so far. But then anyway, I also have green lantern issue 14, um, transformers issue 11. Another book that we, we were reading on the pod yes. at some point. And then my most highly anticipated book of the week that I'm probably going to read like right after we finish this, because I need to know who is Night Watcher? <laughs> Night Watcher number one from Teenage Mutant Ninja, of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles has finally come out. We covered this on the news a long time ago, and I'm long very, very excited yeah. for, for that issue. But yeah, that's uh, that's my polls for the week. What else did you get, Katie? I know you don't have well, your physical been to the shop yet. yet, so we're just going off the yeah. old poll list. I, it's, we're just reversing what we did last week. You know, exactly, like one of us has yeah. the books, the other one doesn't. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be grabbing DC vs. Vampires, World War V, uh, Dick Tracy, number four, Gotham City Sirens, number two, uh, and Transformers. I think that's I think that's it on my list for this week. Very cool. The, the ones that you... we've already yeah. grabbed. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. Do you have an order in your mind for this? I think we're all different publishers, right? Yeah, we're all different publishers mm-hmm. this week. Um I think so, we should end with have... Heart Piercer since it's the end of the arc. Okay, I'm down to end with Heart Piercer. Um, let's start with the pedestrian. Let's start with a beginning. If I you want to end, I was going to say it end. feels like it makes sense if we're ending with an end to start with a beginning. And then we'll go from the pedestrian to let's say Kardak, our our one shot for the week, and then we'll go into Winnie, uh, and then end with Heart Piercer. Works for me. So uh, let's. Let's go into Pedestrian. Let's talk about last week's brand yes. new number one that we didn't get a chance to talk at, about before. And I'm very excited to talk to you about this. Me too. Let's do it. The Pedestrian number one. Behold the Pedestrian. A strange visitor speedwalks into Summer City and silently changes the lives of its residents. But not all is quite in this sleepy small... Not all is quiet in this sleepy small town... An ancient conflict linked to the secret history of the street signs is brewing. Don't walk, run. In The Pedestrian, justice always has the right of way. The writer on this series is Joey Esposito of Batman Urban Legends, Aquaman, and Grim Fairy Tales. The artist is Sean Von Gorman of Kiss, Star Trek, and The Crying Boy. The colorist is Josh Jensen, and the letterer is Sean Lee. 
we had to wait a week to talk about this one because I didn't have uh, my physical copy yet. Katie, do you want your, your to t- give me your thoughts a week after you have initially read this? How are you feeling about The Pedestrian? I like it so much. It's like, it's <laughs> the type of funny that's super duper up my alley, which is, it's funny because of how seriously the, like the, the hero here is the pedestrian. And as I mentioned in the blurb, he speed walks everywhere and he like follows the the laws of the road. So he will not cross the street if the hand is telling him not to cross the street, which lets a bad guy get away immediately. But he is so like, I don't, he does not say, I think a single word in this entire book, but he, he is absolutely completely stoic uh there's incredibly they got me every time the little sound effects when he starts to walk yes it's <laughs> swish like, right yeah little swishes as he like, it's like i don't know his thighs chafe together it's so funny push 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 push, push. <laughs> it like gives him the motion lines while he's speed walk it is just so funny to me in the way that i believe joey has seen on sean van gorman absolutely wanted it to be it just works we also have a lot of interesting stuff going on he's not in most of the issue like he he comes in and goes out but what we're doing is following i think it's four different stories we do like little four little vignettes in the world of summer city it's five five little vignettes yeah and see these little like little pockets of the city and what's going on there and obviously it's all connected with with the pedestrian and it lays such great groundwork for the series that for something incredibly silly like this i'm super hyped there's a really cool villain reveal at one point that we won't get too into uh, but i don't think it's you know particularly hard to guess uh no and the blurb kind of gives a little you know yeah fair enough um, but it, it, there's so much compelling lore in this world, and I think that it works as well as it does, because the book takes it very seriously. It's, it's, yep. like, not meant to be, you know, cartoonishly silly. It is, it is played so straight in this book. And, like, some of the, the characters in the world don't take it seriously. They're like, I, I don't know, man, he could have stopped the guy, but he just let him get away because he didn't want to cross the street. And so, like, people in the world see the ridiculousness of it. But it's not framed in such a way that we as the reader are supposed to see it that way. It's so well done. It's so beautiful. I loved it. How about you, Jay? I agree with with pretty much everything you you said there. I I have ranted long on this podcast about the kind of humor I like and dislike in comics, so I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole too much here. But this is... There's no quips. There's no... no... You know, dumb, you know, jokes, just throwing stuff at the wall, seeing what's like. It is just something that when you play it like this is very funny. The facial expressions are hilarious. This guy's like always like leaning forward with like his lips pursed and like looking at you with like these these goggled eyes. Like just so funny. The scene of him there watching the, the news like still in his suit on his couch is just so funny. And it 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 entertains me to no end. And the way that it's handled, I don't know if it's, like, the original idea behind this was to do it as a series of, like, anthologies that would eventually connect to more, but it kind of feels like that. Like, this is, like, kind of five, what would work as five anthology stories. Like you mm-hmm. said, there's there's the connective tissue, kind of, throughout, of the pedestrian and, and kind of stuff being revealed. But it is separate little entertaining stories of how the pedestrian stops these various crimes or interacts with these various people. And it's really cool. It's like you said, we get a good look at the world here, and the pedestrian isn't really the focal character this is like yeah. one of those stories that takes the idea and it's very funny to do it with this kind of vigilante if you want to call it that but it's one of those ones where it's like ah oh, we're gonna leave the vigilante to be an unknown vigilante and we'll follow the the normal people in the world as they interact with this vigilante and i think it works really well here um, oh yeah and i think uh the art by sean von gorman carries so, so much of like what yeah. makes this entertaining and funny because um like you said like the motion lines and then like we get pages like this where like the, the stop signs are given so much. Oh, that's fantastic, too. But the stop signs are given, like, so much uh, importance on the page. And then just the way his face is drawn in, like, 
that little bit of the face that you get through his, you know, yes. giant sock looking uh, suit is just Ugh. always giving the the perfect expression to like make you laugh in the moment. <laughs> like this I'm entire sequence where he's helping a character parallel park in a really tight space. Yeah. There's so much personality that comes out through it in so few panels. It like it really just works phenomenally on an art level. Absolutely. And it's so funny. <laughs> <gasps> it's 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 hilarious. I I really want more of this. I think this is a three issue mini, if I'm not mistaken, uh, from when I looked on League of Comic Geeks. Maybe the fourth just isn't on there yet, um, because I think mainly Magma has done four issue minis. Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe this is three, maybe it's four, whatever it is. I'm very excited to get more of this world as we go into oh yeah the inevitable showdown with this terrifying villain, and yes. I am very <laughs> excited for that. Yeah, phenomenal vibes all the way across. Yeah, great vibes. A great first issue that really Maybe. gives you what you need um, to learn about this character in this world. Uh, yeah. I'm excited. Me too. But speaking of first issues, but also only issues, are you ready to talk about <laughs> Kardak the Mystic? A one shot. Let's do it. Kardak the Mystic. All John Cardi ever wanted was to be recognized for his talents at magic tricks and sleight of hand. He's talented, but not enough to get noticed for it until he comes across a, unbeknownst to him, cursed ruby. This ruby grants John the power of invisibility. As Kardak the Mystic, he performs feats no one else can with this magic. Unfortunately for him, going invisible isn't just a trick of the eyes, but rather entering another realm parallel to our own. And something inside that realm wants to use Kardak to enter our world for dark purposes. This is coming to us from writer Joe Corallo of Beckstar, DC Pride, and King Arthur, the Knights of Justice. The artist is Butch K. Mappa of Star Wars Adventures, Midnight Western Theater Witch Trial, and Grim Fairy Tales. The colorist is Ellie Wright, and the letter is Jack Morelli. Jay, I... Correct me if I'm wrong. Is this your first foray into the Archie universe? Um, I think I've read bits and pieces of things especially like i think i read some of the like archie shorts mm -hmm. that were like a thing at one point but yeah for for, for all intents and purposes yes <laughs> this is my my first major foray into archie because my friend joe corallo wrote this and i was like ah gotta i gotta pick that up oh yeah um and a good place to start because little fact about me i loved magicians and magic when i was younger so <laughs> How much this did you love them, Jay? A lot. I, I was I was big into magic. Enough to, magic. to have a magician identity of your own? You know, we're gonna move on. We're gonna we're gonna move <laughs> on because that is neither here nor there. <laughs> Alright, okay. Irrelevant to Kardak the Mystic, which um is a one shot, by the way. I don't know if you mm -hmm. said that already, Katie, uh, in this section. But I figured we'd start there. And it's essentially like a new origin. I don't know if you read the letter in the back. I ended I up reading the letter in the back after, which is also super cool. Mm -hmm. Just like kind of how that came. This is a character that I believe is 83, 85 years old. Yeah, he's older than Archie. Yeah, very old character here. Um, and so this is like a new, essentially, origin, kind of new take on this character. You get an origin for him and a fully self-contained story that kind of goes through a, a, a full little arc. And... I loved it. I thought it was really freaking cool. Right? I love the intro with all the, like, you know, magician-y stuff because, you know, that speaks to me. I think it's cool. <laughs> it's fun. And then you kind of get the introduction of the real magic, this amulet that is super important. And um, that was really cool. There's this, like, horrifying scene of, like, this woman, like, crawling out of the older woman's mouth. Terrifying. Um, and then I thought the way that they kind of, like, slowly introduced the, like, curse of it was really cool with like this like mm -hmm. shadowy figure constantly lurking you got i showed this when you were talking like you have these this like two-page spread that's really cool with these like long panels but then you kind of have um kardak like starting to figure out like oh no this is really bad and he kind of comes up with a plan and it's a really cool like fairly simple resolution but it's a really cool way to do it and there's a lot of stuff around it that i think is um really well done in terms of like the way that they build out like the world for him like it's mm -hmm. a it's a pretty simplistic world because it's one issue but like you have this 
you know, magic show that nobody cares about, typical trope of, you know, modern magician media. It's like, ah, nobody cares about the magicians anymore. You know, here's your old past as prime magician that nobody cares about a show. And then he gets the real magic. And it's like, ah, everybody cares about a show. And you get cool stuff with like him using the magic and people not realizing it's the magic. And like, there's a scene where he's like working with the sound guys as yeah. he's like hatching his plan and he's using the real magic. And they're like, huh. I don't know, whatever your, your trick is, man, it kind of, it messes with the mics a little bit. We got to try to figure this out. And I was like, that's just so cool. Um, so yeah, I really like the way that this was handled and kind of put together. Doing like a new take on a like really old character mm -hmm. is such a cool thing to do. And also like, got to give a shout out, like Butch Mappa's artwork is so oh, yeah. perfect for this. It's phenomenal. Like some of the pages I really want to show, I don't want to show because they're kind of spoilery. <laughs> but there's some fantastic stuff when stuff kind of starts getting real weird toward the end yeah. there. But, but there's a lot of great stuff in the beginning too like the first page is just great with him like catching a bullet in his teeth like right the art fits so well it's like it kind of like at least in my mind again i have not read a lot of archie but it feels like if you took like a traditional archie style and then like gave it a little bit of edge or like a little bit of like unnaturalness around i can the edges. see that because it's like, got that's kind the of that, that I almost from flat it. energy to it that I yeah. think a lot of Archie goes for. But it has, like, a little bit of, like, mm -hmm. weird vibe around it. And then, like, for his, like, hallucination scenes, you get, like, more of a painted feel for those. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, like, a difference in the coloring or whatever, but they, it's a little bit different in the way that yeah. the, the, like, uh, uh, what do you call them? Like, nightmare sequence? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Visions? Um, but, yeah, I thought this was fantastic. I really, right? really enjoyed this. I, I thought this was great. And the Magician Connection definitely brought it up <laughs> even more for me because I love magicians and I would love more of them in comics. But, yeah, I just I was actually blown away by how good I thought this was. Yeah, I feel like it operates exactly how you want a one-shot to operate. So it true. It does its job as a one-shot so beautifully. Like, it is an incredibly contained story, but it doesn't sacrifice the like emotional depth of it to like jam more stuff in there it still takes the time to look at the relationship between kardak and his fiance it still takes the time to let kardak kind of have these emotional moments where he is like oh no the amulet's evil i better do something <laughs> about that yeah. and it doesn't even sacrifice like the build up to his plan we don't just smash cut to him about to do it. We see yeah. the plan come into action. And I think that that's super important as well because it just, it it lets the book have such a good pace for such a short story, you know? I, I fully agree with you. It really is like a one-shot's one-shot. And it's not mm -hmm. even like, like a lot of one-shots nowadays, at least from what I've seen from like when Zenoscope does a one-shot or when IDW does a one-shot, like, they kind of pad them out so you're getting like at least 32 pages exactly, or like yeah. 48 pages or something like that so they have more room for one shot. This is like a true – like I think it's it's either like 20 or 22 pages, whatever. It's mm -hmm. like a true blown like single issue one shot and doing a full story in that. And I think what you hit on is like that while they don't sacrifice the emotional stuff, it's very like keyed into this like plot. Like, it yes. doesn't divulge to like be like here's this like little thing of the next thing that happened for Archie or like here's the like – things that mm. we can hint at so that you'll get more it wastes no time on anything that isn't crucial to the characters and the plot of this issue mm -hmm. and so it stays so tight to this story that they manage to have a full story with a beginning middle and end satisfying conclusion satisfying arc in a very short package so yeah i 100 percent agree with you this is a fantastic example of how to do a one shot yeah in my opinion. huge 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 props to joe for that yeah yeah fantastic and Butch too, because Jesus, yes. this book yes. looks so good. Yes, <laughs> I was I was just looking at the pacing, but the book itself just is oh. a phenomenal pickup. It really oh, yeah. is, absolutely. But speaking of phenomenal Archie pickups, fan, oh yeah. Next up, we've got Winnie the Pooh, Demon Hunter number two. Let's do it, Winnie the Pooh, Demon Hunter number two. Tark talking bear fights demonic. Forces, lovable companion, and lethal combatant all in one. After all, after their failed attempt to save Piglet, Christopher and his good friend Pooh Bear are called back to the Red Riding Hood's headquarters to await their punishment by the Grandmother Council for disobeying orders. But what has Owl uncovered that unlocks a secret from their pasts? Nick Mueller does everything in this book. 
Uh, mm-hmm. There's a couple editors uh, that work on it as well, which are um, Matthew D. Rise and um, Logan Shell. This is the second issue of this awesome book uh, that obviously was originally released uh, on Kickstarter in these like larger volumes. We're now kind of, this takes the ending bit of the first volume and starts to go into the second volume a little bit. Uh, Katie, what did you think of issue two? Is this your first time reading it this is. stuff? This I've read it and talked about it, it all before. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, on this issue. I think that this issue is even better than the first. I think that it specifically on an art level, we've talked about before watching over the course of a series, somebody's art style develop. And I think that we really, really are getting that with Nick. Uh, like, well, you can like, flip the page on... from when you go from the first volume here to the second volume, and it's like, oh man, the development yeah. there. Like, there's, there's clearly, he clearly has learned so much as he's done this, this series. Like, in the previous volume, there were, like, a good amount of, like, kind of blank backgrounds or, or kind of simplistic backgrounds. Here, we've pretty much always got a scene happening for us, except for when it's intentionally a, a blank background. Uh, yep. He also has really leveled up his, like, coloring and shading game i feel uh which totally is agree. super super effective i it it's really wonderful seeing the art kind of jump especially like you said between though my favorite piece of art and it is from that first volume uh with the the three friends walking in the sunset together yeah we, um, we talked about how nick when he was really try, can do these beautifully rendered pages um mm-hmm. And this is but like, that that's unsustainable for like a full issue when you're doing everything yourself. Oh, yeah. But you can really see with the second volume uh, that he's gotten better and faster, so he's able to do that more often. Yeah, yeah. I also think that it's great to see the the world really expand out here. It's got an interesting blend of we saw it, we saw it a bit in the first volume as well with the villain being the gingerbread man and then Red Riding Hood coming through. It's not just Winnie the Pooh. It's like Winnie the Pooh and all of these fairy tale characters together. So it we're we're really seeing the kind of world out from where Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh are. I, I'm very excited to see where we're going from there because we get some nefarious uh, rumblings from the other side, and we start to see a bit of the lore being laid for like what uh, the villains of this book could possibly want. And I'm very excited to see what that ends up going up to. Because, you know, there's it's Winnie the Pooh fighting demons. The demons are coming yes. from somewhere. Uh, so, coming. you know, we I, I'm, I'm super jazzed to get into the... the, the I was going to say the meat of it, but I feel like I should say, like, dip my paw in the honey pot of it. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is not your first time reading Winnie the Pooh. No, you, it's you, not. You were it's, following we, it along we, on yeah. Kickstarter. Absolutely. We, we finally got to, when we had Nick on way back in episode five, one of the things that I talked about uh, when I was gushing about the book in, in that interview was that I think that Nick does a great job of maintaining, like, the, and I haven't seen anything Winnie the Pooh since I was like six years old, but for my memories of like the heart of Winnie the Pooh and how, how I felt about Winnie the Pooh, and we reached that point because it's really the piglet scene that to me, like, fully and captures that and it gives you the motivation of these characters for the rest of the series and i think it's maybe like a five page sequence uh all together one two three it's a five page sequence i think it's the best thing in winnie the pooh demon hunter uh yeah that i've read so far it's incredibly so strong and, it, and it's yeah, it was yeah. the first time and, and it's in the first volume so like this was why i i loved winnie from like the beginning because i i got this earlier i didn't have to wait until an issue two to get this um, but I think it's great that it's at the beginning of issue two because it's very helpful. Yeah. But like this was where I think my my expectations got kind of changed for the first time because it's like ah okay we're now gonna see you know Piglet and here we have this buffed up you know like Winnie with a chainsaw we have Christopher Robin in this hood like I'm ready to see the the demon hunter Piglet and you get little innocent like I'm regular terrified piglet. for his survival regular Piglet and you're like. Oh no! This book isn't just about giving these all of these characters like these crazy weapons and doing this this big bombastic stuff. Like, here's this heart. Here's why they're fighting. Here's why they're breaking rules. Because 
Pooh made a promise to Piglet. And it's such a, like, wonderful thing. You mentioned the page. It's also just such a great line, like, in the lead-up to it, too. But then we get left with the line of, we'll be friends forever, won't we, Pooh? And it's like, that feels straight out of, like, a classic Winnie the Pooh story. Dude, you know. before that, though, that's what friends are there for, to be brave when you can't. That's some fucking Winnie the Pooh shit, but... I had a yeah, strong this, this connection to Piglet as an anxious child. Um, so he, he, he was real big, big move, big mood, seeing the, this sequence play out. Yeah, it's it's just fantastic. And then, like you said, once you jump forward, and it's, it's I yeah. believe, right basically when we get to the council, uh, to, like, what is volume two, like, all of a sudden, especially, I think you see it in Pooh, like, the way that he starts illustrating Pooh's face, for like the rest of the series, man, it just has so much more emotion, yes. and I love it so much. The way that Pooh starts to look, and I love the council. I'm obsessed with councils in comic books. <laughs> like I have multiple series I have written and am writing where there are councils. I this think councils council. just. Make... I'm a Green Lantern fan. Like, what do you expect? <laughs> I love a good council because they can just add so much drama. Of like, they have this like overseeing power, and they don't really listen. And you're trying to make stuff. So I love the entire council scene. I love what it shows us about Winnie and Christopher, and then we go to, you know, Allie, and we get all that stuff. So, yeah, I, I think this issue is really, really strong, kind of, mainly from a character sense. They then add in, and this is the first major change from the way that it played out in the, like, OG volumes to this, uh, you know, issue form, is that the, the origins kind of moved up. It's pushed up. It comes later. I want to say it's toward the end of volume two. I was, like, looking in the volumes, and it's not here. It's definitely later. And it's pulled up to give us the origin here in the same time that we get uh, the Piglet origin too. Mm. And I think that all plays out really nicely to just oh yeah, kind of like fully get you to buy into the characters now. It's like, okay, mm. issue one, set up the world. Issue two, get you to buy into the characters. And then issue three and four can tell the like rest of the story. Like you said, the the meat of the honey pot or yes. whatever, the, the paw of the honey pot, whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, I think this issue, the way that they kind of reformatted it to be an issue in the series was so effective in getting you where you need to be halfway through this series. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We we I'm I'm thrilled after talking to Nick to to finally be reading through many. Um yeah, it's it's doing great. Super excited for the next uh the next issue. But Absolutely. speaking of next issues, wanna go to our next issue? <laughs> Potentially the final issue, at least the final issue in this arc, of Heart Piercer. Yes. Heart Piercer number four. It all comes down to this. As Atala reckons with both the Howler and his army of werewolves, and the demons haunting her own past, can she atone for her sins and unlock the power to defeat her monstrous foe? The answers lie here, in the pulse-pounding final chapter of this dark fantasy epic. The writer here is Rich Daug of TMNT Universe, Edge of Spider-Verse, and Magic the Gathering. The artist is Gavin Smith of TMNT and Star Trek. The colorist is Nicholas Bergdorf, and the letterer is Justin Birch. Jay, yes. you have thus far adored Heart Piercer. It's I got have. one of your favorite artists, I think, right? At least you love his art from yeah, TMNT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I love Gavin Smith. This, this... Gavin Smith might, like, have with this issue, cemented himself as, like, my favorite artist in comics right now. Like, Gavin Smith is so ridiculously good. The amount of times this man has told me that he's been considering buying, like, original uh, pages from this book. I do. They're expensive, but I want one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I might, I might buy one after this. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, but, but this is number yeah, four. This the, the conclusion, at this least, of the first arc. Yes. Hopefully not of the series. Um, yeah. but it, it seems, based it on does... the ending, based on everything they've said, it, yeah. it feels like it's meant to be the first arc of something yeah. much longer. So I hope this isn't the end. But at the same time, this is a good chapter end. You know? Yes. Like, yeah. For our first mission, for our first chapter, this issue is just balls to the walls action. Oh, yeah. And then you get kind of some nice heart in the middle of it. I love this issue. It immediately starts with like that big fight feel of like that climactic final battle. It gives you what I love, which is like that classical, like good versus evil type dialogue that's just like oh, yeah. so it pulls you in, man, and it's epic and it's exciting. You know, the the Howler has so many great lines about, like, 
him being the howler and i just love it like this one here like there is only the howler and i'm like yes good go with this full villain you know feel i just think he's such especially in this issue he's such like that terrifyingly cool villain Mm -hmm. like he gets i don't think it's a a spoiler since it happens on like page four he gets pierced by this you know um unicorn unicorn in the eye which actually ends up being really important that he's pierced there in the name of the book and everything and i love the way it all ties together not gonna fully spoil but i love it love it love it but he gets pierced by an eye uh, in it, through the eye in like page four and i was like oh no oh first i was like hell yeah that's awesome but then he like it, it, you know he kind of has his like reaction i'm like no 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 we're going back to one of those books that like resolves in like five pages and then we just have a bunch of fallout it's like i don't want that out of this book gavin smith can do so much great art and i need it and then nope he's still going (laughs) who cares he's gonna make a quip about wanting somebody's eye patch once he's done because he needs it now that's so terrifying so like you stab this one in the eye and he's just going at your friend who like has an eye patch and being like i'll take that one off your corpse when i'm done and i'll be fine and it's like holy shit that's so cool right he's terrifying but he's cool <laughs> and just it's an awesome fight the design we get i'm not fully gonna spoil it, but we get a like new heart piercer design yes. for like the back half of this and it's gorgeous and it's awesome and i love this is is a near perfect issue for me like it's so- i love everything that happened in this it's my favorite issue the issue one is fantastic but this is my favorite issue of heart piercer now Easy. this yeah. is so ridiculously good I don't think there's a thing I dislike in this issue, except for the fact that it might be the end, you know? <laughs> and they give you a great setup to go on the next mission after it. Like, you get your great end, you get a nice little, like, here's the more to come. I love it. I want more. Give me issue five right now. Yes. I want to hit up, because Gavin Smith's art, amazing. The, the, everything about the issue, really, 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 really phenomenal. I want to really focus in on the bit of Atala's backstory that we get. It's such a huge reveal. Like, we start off in issue one with her working for the big bad evil guy. And it's like, how did this happen? And we get this sequence of how it happens. And it's so heart-wrenching and gorgeous and, like... It's beautifully illustrated. Oh, yeah. It's in the dark mostly, and we just have these kind of characters in the light with this green brazier. And we we oh my gosh, that entire sequence, phenomenal. And then the fallout from that sequence as she like kind of confronts her past. Phenomenal. This entire issue, this Perfect. entire series has been so good. I feel like issue two was my only real misstep. And in a four issue uh ser- like arc it actually is less of a misstep because it felt more Fully like, because I think in issue two, my complaint was that like, felt like we were kind of wasting time on something that wasn't like the main plot. And it turns yeah. out it is the main plot uh, of this, yep. of this arc. And oh my gosh, every issue of this, I feel did something cool and unexpected, which is such a, Fully. such a boon to get to as a writer and as a book. To be like, yes, I am doing yeah. things Honestly, like, like, that people don't think yeah. are going to happen. Oh, yeah. Fully agree. Like, I would use this issue to, like, teach people about doing, like, a big bombastic climax while, like, not losing having, like, a heart in a story of your book. Because, like you said, and I, I offhandly mentioned it just because I had so much to say. Like, there is that amazing bit of heart in the middle of this issue yes. that is that backstory. It finally connects. It lets you know what's going on. It lets you know why Atala feels the way that she does and why she's motivated and all of that. Like, it's just so good. It brings back the unicorn, which is really cool oh, and exciting. So cool. And, um, yeah, it's just, it, it then leads to, like, a fantastic, I'm not going to spoil things, but there's just a fantastic, like, inner cutting art moment that focuses on, like, the Howler and Atala right yeah. coming out of this. And it's, like, back and forth. And it's so good and like this issue is just so good at making use of the medium giving you that full issue essentially fight scene but not losing having a greater story and heart to the issue this is like having your cake and eating it too like this issue does everything (laughs) and i love that so much yeah i love this issue i could keep going but i'm I'm gonna try not to like spend 20 minutes talking about how freaking good this issue is uh give us more heart piercer i'm looking at you rich down and kevin smith (laughs) Dark Horse? Absolutely. This is a threat. Of what? I don't know, but it's a threat. 
<laughs> he name. won't he won't align himself with me in threatening a major publisher. Rude. I will not. I will not threaten a major publisher. Um <laughs> <laughs> Well <laughs> look. I'll 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 that's fine. I'll find it myself. Yeah, he's gonna pierce your heart if you don't. I'm gonna you pierce know, your heart. <laughs> exactly. But that is uh gonna take us to the end of our pull list rec. So I think we should go figure out yeah. what books this week actually got that uh, that beautiful, beautiful PLR. Pull list rec. Let's find out. All right. The uh, books have been read. The books have been reviewed, which means yep. it's time to decide on our pull list recs for the week. And what a week to like start right? with this format. Like, these were four like, I, I I like I wouldn't even just say like four great like these were like four basically home runs like it's right? so hard to pick similar rec. like if there was ever a week where it was like this might have been like a wall to wall polis rex in our old format where we just went like but we each get one we each get um, one it's gonna and be if you choose the same one yeah that's you know tough titties yeah we only get I, one I'm stuck between two. Um, I think I know what you're going to pick and it's not going to be one of the two. So it won't make my decision easier where like if you <laughs> pick one of the two, I'd be like, well, I'll just at least do the other one. But I'm very stuck between two of them um, because like I'm, I'm deciding how I want to handle this form of the polis rec. Like, is That's it the so book fair, that you should just is pick it, up off the Is shelf? this something to put on your polis or is it just this yeah. is our favorite book? Of the is week? it just this the, be- is this the best book? Um, That's really tough here. Oh, this is tough. This is real Well, tough. the good news I'm, is you I'm have a, a moment to think. Yeah, I have a moment to think. Moment I'm, gonna, to think. I'm gonna throw it to you. I think I know yes. which way I'm leaning, and I know my justification. But we're gonna, we're gonna. All right. Yeah. Well, my pull list rec, I think, as a surprise to no one who has both read this book and knows me, is going to be the pedestrian number one. This is the. Thank it you. just it's such a sweet spot for me in terms of the type of funny it is, Absolutely. how funny it is, and the like self serious deep lore that's clearly going on. This is going to be a series that I absolutely go nuts for. I know it. So, the pedestrian number one, Katie Markham's pull list rec for this week. That's that's fair. And, and you went with you went with an issue one there, something that people can just slap on their yes. pull list. And I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna follow your lead. So I'm gonna just quickly flash this through the screen to say, is this one of my favorite issues of like probably the year? Yeah, <laughs> but it's an issue four. I'm gonna tell you to pull the trade because I'm sure a trade's gonna come out, and then. I'll tell you to pull that whenever that comes out. But that's an issue four. So I'm going to tell you what I think you should just grab from your store right now, which is Card Act the Mystic, uh, the one it shot. It was so good. It's so ridiculously it's so good. good. One of the best one shots I've read in a long time. Like, if you just want something, you don't have to worry about anything else, any continuity, any long storylines. You can grab this off the shelf, have a great time with a great issue, with great art, great pacing, a good story. A character that you don't have to know anything else about. This is the book. Pull Card Act the Mystic right now. That's my pull list rec. Hell yeah. Uh, but that's going to take us to an end on our, uh, our pull list rec for the week. Which yeah. means it is time for the Creator Corner. Here we are in the Creator Corner where we sit back, relax, talk about books, talk about the industry, talk about how we make things go from our brain to the page. <laughs> Looks <laughs> different every week. I know, and it's very this entertaining week every week. is very different. Uh, a little a little joke there, because I told Jade's companion series, uh, a companion episode to two previous creative corners. Uh, we've talked about character design, like their physical we have. design. We've talked about creating villains we have i want to talk about creating heroes in kind of the okay. same way that uh we and i'm different from main character like we're talking about a, a like actual heroic main character so not our unlike companion episode to three uh, <laughs> look when all of our stuff is about writing they all connect in certain ways <laughs> um so we are, are going to talk about how to make your main character a hero. And whether okay. we want to lean into superhero or like hero of legend, we can do a little bit of both. Uh, there gotcha. are kind of ways hero to make your character. 
plug for a friend of the pod, Lee Hinkley Barnes uh, book? Yeah, I think volume, uh, <laughs> volume the, the, two should be, volume two should be live right the, now. Right? I, I think uh, some of them are up on uh, Reed's site now, but I think the Kickstarter is going up soon. Sweet. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there, there's all sorts of main characters that you'll make. Today we're going to talk about making heroes. So Jay, first off, what there, do you think it means for a main character to, to be a heroic main character? I have like a hard line between superhero and hero in my head. And like, mm. I think I'm harsher on superhero than a lot of people. Like, I've often said the reason I'm such a DC fan is because DC's characters feel like superheroes to me. I don't think Marvel superheroes feel like superheroes a lot of the time. Like, I think they feel like heroes, but they don't feel like... Su- like, I picture the Justice League when I think superheroes. Like, those, mm-hmm. you know, tights and capes and, you know, like, those type of figures. I'm like, that's a superhero. That's what a superhero is. But to kind of expand the thing, to, to just creating a hero, I I think there's two trains of thoughts. And maybe it is, like, if you want to go old school, not as true as much because they kind of both dip into both now. But the old school mindset, the old school Marvel versus the old school DC mindset of relatable hero versus larger than life hero. Mm -hmm. Um, I tend to lean into, I think if you want to do a true hero, we've talked about flawed and, you know, uh, like unlikable main character. But if we're talking about you want your hero hero, you want your Superman, you want your Batman, you want that type of a hero. I think they should feel larger than life. I think they Mm -hmm. should feel like a god amongst men. Like, I want that feeling of this person is better than you and you know it. Like, they can have flaws that make them, you know, like, you know, have these problems. But those should be better than you, too. Like, their flaws should be bigger than your flaw. Just like their positives should be bigger. Amp them up to 11. If you're a pro wrestling fan, you've ever listened to, like, a pro wrestler talk, they're like, turn your normal personality up to 11 for pro wrestling. I think heroes are the same way. Turn their flaws and their, like, biggest strength up to 11. So you go from, like, okay, what's Batman's positives? Okay, he's smart, and he's cunning, and he's skilled fighter. Turn that all up to 11. He's smart enough to beat gods. He's, you know, strong enough to fight with the Justice League. But turn his flaws up, too, to, like, okay, he isn't good at connecting with people. Okay, that means he literally will, like, refuse to engage in anything fun sometimes, you know? He doesn't trust himself. He will never kill under any circumstances. Not just he'll try not to kill. He will never, under any circumstances, kill anyone. You just turn everything up to 11. And I think that helps you create this larger-than-life hero. No, yeah, I think that's a phenomenal kind of uh, uh, starting point for what makes a hero feel heroic in their book. And looking at the books, I was inspired by the books that we read uh, this week, this is going to be last week's creative corner, the but because I was specifically looking at Winnie the Pooh Demon Hunter and the Pedestrian, mm. where I'm like, oh, this is this is interesting because both of these characters are heroes. They both come at yeah. heroism from kind of a different angle, with one of them being an adapted like character turned hero, and one of them being a ridiculous example of a hero who is still very much a hero in his own book. Uh, I I can't I can't look at the cover of the pedestrian without laughing. <laughs> it's so funny. You have to I put it, it down because every time I make eye contact with him, I do laugh. <laughs> um, but it's it's so interesting to look at because both of them are you know heroes. One of them stops for traffic. One of them cuts demons in half with a chainsaw. But Turned even up to so, eleven, both of them. Yeah, you know pedestrian. Won't god da- won't break any law, so he won't goddamn walk across the crosswalk if he's not allowed to. That's eleven. Winnie the Pooh. They gave him a goddamn chainsaw and let him go after demons. That's turned up to goddamn eleven. You know, I think like Winnie the Pooh baby turned up to like fifteen or seventeen. Uh, yeah, actually, Winnie might be <laughs> turned up to, to ninety nine. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that's such a it's amazing how perfectly your. Uh, explanation of hero mapped onto these these guys because you really have, I'm just incredibly stupefied and impressed that you were able to break it down so beautifully. Uh, shout out to professional wrestlers. Um, yeah, shout out to pro wrestlers. I mean, I think that it's it's been a known quantity within the superhero community for a long time that there's a reason that pro wrestlers 
are good as like they make sense as superhero actors. It's like oh okay yeah because yeah. they are used to being that larger than life of, version. You know, a lot of comic writers, you know, are they feel like Daniel Warren Johnson's probably like one of the biggest names in comics right now, and everybody knows he's such a huge pro wrestling fan. His well, Transformers is... book is just them doing pro wrestling moves <laughs> to each other all the time, and uh, do well, a power bomb. Did he write his, his a pro wrestling, wrestling book? book? Yeah, do a power bomb. Do a power bomb. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So like that. That it, it really helps to take your character and just make them heroic, super heroic. But I guess there is that question of what's the what's the upper line? Like if yeah. if you're turning them up to eleven, where does it go too far? Where does it become, you know? either unbelievable or so unrelatable that it's no longer an appealing character? That's a great question. And I think that the answer is is twofold. The first thing is, like I said, you have to turn the flaws up to 11 too. You can't mm-hmm. give them a normal flaw with like a turned up to 11 heroic personality. You know, um, if Which I think the is flaw pro- was like... Yeah, yeah, Which yeah. No, the no, problem no, that no, people no. have with Superman that people like ascribe to Superman because he doesn't really he's a he's a good boy he's a boy scout he doesn't really have uh you know a, a flaw that matches his level of power and I think that creates a lot of tension with people who dislike Superman because I think if you yeah. read enough Superman you see that he is flawed in other ways that then make up for that and like his you could say that his like moral compass as much as it is a boon it could also be a flaw. It's one of those things where it's like so high that perhaps yep. it's it's a little too much. But I uh, I think that's a great example of maybe not having a a comparable flaw to your your yeah. hero power. Well, I've always been, and maybe like this is you know something I would I I think especially in a superhero world, and you you'll see a lot of people being like. I don't get why this hero has a a, a, a no kill rule or why like that's a, a thing. He it doesn't make sense in the universe. I'm like, I've always seen that as a flaw. Like I always look at heroes oh, yeah. with a no kill rule as a flaw. Like obviously you have the reverse of like a red hood who's willing to kill everybody, and that's also a flaw. But if you have a and this is actually kind of a problem with Superman, especially in the comics of like Superman doesn't really have a no kill rule. He has a I'll try not to kill rule. He's yeah. killed people when necessary because. He is just written so so many times like being this person. Like, oh, if I absolutely need to kill this person to help people, I will. Like, and I I think you're right that that kind of uh, struggles about. So let's talk about Superman a little bit and like how you balance him. And I think that often, kind of the Superman problem is that a lot of fans don't want him given flaws, and so you're in this battle of either I can't make him interesting. Or I'm going to annoy people by giving them flaws. But I think a lot of comic books, luckily, I think when you go to adaptive media, people get more like, no, this is this is not adapting the version that I like. I think in comics, you get a little bit more play. And comics mm-hmm. often play with a few things of like, Superman often does have at least a de- a like, little bit of a, a mean streak in terms of anger issues in the comics. Like, yeah. Superman will often have be a little bit of a hothead and they'll typically play in like the, ah, you know, he's, he's a, you know, southern farm boy and he, you know, he gets angry and he wants to fight people when things go wrong like he's a little bit of i'm gonna punch my way out of my problems like that's a little bit superman he, yeah. he's not always the most tactful he's like i'm gonna punch you in the face that that's how i'm gonna yeah. solve this and then the other thing is you just turn up to 11 the danger that everybody around him is in mm-hmm. is that superman's big weakness is like he's invulnerable he is perfect he is infallible everybody around him isn't the world <laughs> isn't and when you really play with that those give you the most interesting Superman stories, I mean. Mm-hmm. So it's important to crank up those those flaws to 11, as I've said multiple times now, but also like make sure the world around your hero fits the hero that you're building in mm-hmm. a way that's going to make for an interesting dynamic. Um, you know, Batman. Okay, what world are you building for Batman? Maybe the cops don't like him, and now he has to play with that. There's your your big thing. Or maybe he's working with the police, and then... That comes to all different kinds of issues because certain officers don't trust him and certain people don't like that. And then people are trying to get him to reveal who he is because he's working with the police. Like there's all these interesting dynamics you can play with. And dynamics are a big thing too. Superheroes. And this is actually I think one of the biggest problems with modern superhero comics because there are just so many superheroes now that your supporting cast is often filled out with other superheroes. I personally think superheroes become a lot more boring when there aren't non-superheroes around them. Oh, yeah. 
Like, I think one of the most interesting things about superheroes is the supporting cast of non-superheroes around them. That's one of the reasons that I was on the... I was fully aboard the uh, New 52 uh, despising when they matched up Superman and Wonder Woman. It's like, no. Superman's... Like, his best relationship is with his friends and his beautiful wife. <laughs> like, if you if you... Especially with a character like Superman, who's so incredibly super. It's like, no way you're getting away with now his, like, personal life is super as well. Yeah, because, like, what do you... Like, so many... And people... There's people who get really mad about, like, the, the damsel in distress thing. But, like, it's so necessary to Superman. Like, it can be Jimmy, too. Like, it doesn't have to be, oh, yeah. you know, just love. Jimmy like, it can be any number of more characters. so the but, damsel. Like, Superman, Superman needs a goddamn damsel in yes. distress because otherwise he doesn't work as a character. You and Lois works him with so Woman, well. Who can't be a damsel in distress. Like... You're screwed. What, yeah. How are you pulling on the threads of Superman when his, you know, now significant other is arguably more powerful than he is <laughs> or just as powerful as he is? Like, what are you doing? What are you how doing? How are you getting to this guy? And like you said, Lois is so good at it because she has, her personality is very in like, and there's her personality, there's her cranked up to personality, 11 flaws. She has no, like, it goes right <laughs> over her head that what she's doing is so ridiculously stupid and is going to hurt oh things so God. much more than it's going to help things a lot of the time. She's like, no, I got to get the story because, yeah, you do. But you crank up to 11 that, like, do not do not go in there with the people who want to murder you. That's really, really dumb. Because she gonna is her own in a bad brand spot. of superhero. Uh, where it's like, oh, okay, yeah. yes, her flaw is that she will put herself in these dangerous situations. But it's also, you know, because she's being heroic. She's doing the right thing. Uh, and I think that kind Absolutely. of takes us to another yeah. pillar of uh, what we're looking for with a hero as a main character. Uh, what do you think their their motivation is, you know, supposed to look like? This is a tough one because I think that it's very different when you're looking at it as an indie creator than when mm -hmm. you're looking at it as like, I'm working on Batman, I'm working on Superman, I'm working on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I'm working on, you know... Um, I'm trying to think of other indie superheroes so that I'm not just named. I'm working on Spawn, you know, whatever the hell it is. Like, I think when you're when you're doing those, it's like okay, they're so well established. Like, they just want to do good at this point. Like, we've yeah. we've gotten there. Just wanting to do good and do the right thing and help people is the motivation now. Because um, we know they're their but, deeper motivation and like yeah. what drives them. When to you're coming out as an indie creator, you have to establish immediately like why are they doing this. And if you start with, like, a superhero who's just... And I actually... Because I worked on my first creator-owned uh, superhero book recently, and I was, I was writing that. Like, I recently came up against that. I was like, ah, how do I create a superhero? Like, it sounds obvious, but when you're working in a mini series and you're trying to create a superhero from the ground up, it's like, how do I get this character to logically want to just help, like, all people? Like, that's a pretty big motivation to be like, yeah. how do I get this guy to just want to be a general superhero who helps people? And I'm not going to, because I'm hoping that series will still come out and do things. I'm not going to fully go into how I land on that in my book, but I'll tell you kind of the thought process and how you do land on that is you go, okay, what is the moment where they're going to decide that? And you go, okay, how do I build to that moment? And like, what do they want up until that moment? Because your character can't be motivationless until they get their motivation. You want yeah. one motivation to then lead into the main motivation. So you start out, you want to start on a very human level and go like, well, Maybe this person wronged them and they want to stop this person. And then in the process, they save some people and now they see what it is like to help people. And now they can have that greater motivation that they want to just help people. And you just need a logical building blocks to get to that motivation. Um, and I think as an indie creator, having that foundation is so important to build. Um, and I think a place to see that in action, indie superhero, looking at local man, his motivation at oh, the yeah. start was by no means to help people. It was, I'm going to be a superhero because of fame, fortune, and, you know, getting out of my small Midwestern town. And then, you know, he had his, his time as Cross Jack, and, you know, all that happened with Local Man. And then he comes back and he starts helping again for kind of selfish reasons where he's like, oh shit, something's afoot. And then he has that moment with, I'm totally forgetting his name, the blue guy. Ha. Huh. You know the one. His 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 nemesis in town. Oh, oh, yeah. oh the guy yeah, and like the animal looking suit. Yeah. Oh, frick. Ah. 
That uh, guy. Uh, you all listen to uh, the local man bonus guy. episode. You that know what guy. we're talking about. Um, yeah, he yeah. has the really like poignant emotional moment with that guy, and he's like, "Oh shit, yeah, helping people, right?" And so then the motivation turns to helping people, and we are seen as he goes yep. around along in his journey as local man, as that becomes my motivation is helping people, is doing the right thing. I don't want the town to be flooded. Okay, yeah. fine, I will do this. For, like, the right reasons. Um, and so I think it's a really good point. That... Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, no, you, you keep going, you keep going. I, I think you made like a very good point. That it's, it's not that he started off as, all right, I'm a superhero already, so I'm going to be motivated by good things and, uh, you know, the right things for a superhero. He very much was not. Uh, and, in fact, was, I think, very intentionally not. Because he was supposed to be a, you know, washed out superhero. Yeah. Local Man's such a good, like, teaching tool of a comic book. Like, if you just look at that, mm-hmm. like, they do such, like, as much as they're tackling, uh, like, the super story from an interesting angle, they do such, like, fundamental stuff. Like, oh, yeah. I, that book is kind of built on, like, fundamentals. Like I said, I'm probably getting annoying saying it at this point, but turn up to 11. Like, they just turn. And then his flaws of, like, ah, I'm sexually, but I'm just going to sleep with people. I'm going to, I'm not going to really think about people on a personal level. And I'm just going to like, go for my, turn up to 11. Like he ends up sleeping with a super villain. Like all this, shit, like it is just, they turn that very human flaw up to 11 and they do all that kind of stuff. And then they even have an issue because of time travel shenanigans where you can get his current motivations, like put up against in a mirror to his OG motivations so perfectly yes. that it's like, ah, this is how motivations can grow across a character, across the series. And that's so cool to look at. Mm-hmm. But I'm interested in, like, how you approach, like, setting the foundations and then, like, putting together your building blocks of a character motive Or a hero's motivation, not just any yeah, character. Yeah. Uh, I, I am not great at writing, like, just hero heroes. Like, I have not... I'm trying to think of the last time I wrote a superhero comic. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's been a hot minute. Uh, especially yeah. looking at like a true superhero comic instead of like a kind of anti-hero-y comic. I, but I think it's because I'm always at the start of the story when I'm, you know, building yeah. these these stories. So they haven't gotten to their like big hero turn yet. What's the opposite of a heel turn in wrestling? Face turn. A fa- they haven't gotten to their like real face turn yet where they go from I'm doing things for myself to I'm doing things for other people now, what? Um... And so I, I think that it is kind of just the start of that process of starting them with a motivation that makes sense for them, starting them with a motivation that ties to something that they want in a probably selfish way, because most wants are going to be selfish. And it it's part of becoming a hero where you, you turn to that selflessness and, and start to do Absolutely. your Batman thing. Um, but that being said, I, I do want to make a, a just quick kind of non, uh, <laughs> non-passioned non argument for it. You can just have a superhero who does good because they're a hero. They're not going to be like crazy interesting, but they are going to, you know, be a vehicle of superheroics. I think that something like Pedestrian, we don't know what his motivations are. Uh, He is an enigma, but he is effective, funny, and fun to watch, even without knowing his motivations, as he is doing good things just from our perspective for the sake of doing the right thing, Uh, whether it's, I'm going to give you a fold why I think that works in this this issue Um, and why I would like how I think you have to approach doing something like that. One, we talked about this. He's not the focal. We're not following him. So it's it's less you feel less inclined to know somebody's motivation when you're not following them when they're not the main kind of person. You couldn't like, catch him even if you we were have, following him. You've yeah. seen how quickly you have a he Superman speed like character. You have a Superman like character as like a side character, or as like a character that comes in. You don't necessarily need to know all the motivations. Um, the second reason is, I think because this isn't like a take it completely. It takes itself seriously, which makes it entertaining. But it's not like a true like ah here's this hero book where we're gonna follow this hero on this journey. Like it's oh, look how ridiculous this guy is and look how yeah. funny, like, interesting. so I think those are a couple of the reasons that, that it works in this book so well. But I think that's really the thing is like, if you're going to be looking at like, 
how the world interacts with this person or how he interacts with your main character, then yes, you can kind of go from that angle. But if we're following a character who's doing heroes just heroics just for heroes sake, I want some sort of reasoning behind it, I think. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you are going to have a very hard time like getting your, your audience attached to this character just because most people aren't going to sit there and be like, ah, yes, just saving the world for the for the vibe of it is such a relatable character, you know? And I think one of the things you can look at is like, I think television does a great job. We're old school, tele- not modern streaming television that only has like six episodes. We go back to like superhero shows back in the day that had like, you know, 20 episodes per season or whatever. And they went for you, like the character growth that you'll watch on that kind of stuff. And like the inciting incidents and what drives these people to be characters because they have all that space and all that time and TV shows love character stuff. I think that is actually one of the best places you can go to look at like character motivations because character motivations in classical television are like the thing. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one of the best places you can go to like learn about that just as a quick no, yeah, aside. Super, super rad. Wonderful. Yeah. So I think that hits on motivations. We hit on what makes a hero a hero. That's what, that's what I had rocking and rolling for this creator quarter. So if we're, uh, if we're all set to rock and roll a roll. We're going to, we're going to rock as we roll. We're going to rock um, as uh, we roll. Do you want to tell people uh, what they can find this Saturday before next week's uh, main episode? Yes, we're going to be having a bonus episode out this Saturday for you. We're going to be talking about Stargazer from Mad Cave Studios. Uh, it's a very exciting book. I uh, picked it up at C2E2 and haven't read it yet. Uh, and now I will read it. Uh, coming to us from I know Anthony nothing about Cleveland it. and thing. Antonio Fuso. Uh, but naturally, this coming Wednesday... We will have uh, a brand new episode for you. Jay, what are we going to be pulling for that episode? Yeah. Yeah, we have five polls. Um, We're going to finally be uh, hitting on a couple books where we missed the first. Oh, sorry. We have six books uh, across like five. Sorry, seven. I don't know how many books it is at this point. I can't math. Um, I think it's seven books across five series. Yeah, that sounds right. So it's seven books across five series because we mentioned this uh, in our catch up episode. There were a couple of books where we were doing issue one and we decided just to slide them over to doing the first two issues in the same month. Um, so we're finally going to be talking about Daredevil, Woman Without Fear. We uh, read Erica Schultz's last foray into Electra Daredevil during Gang War. And now we finally get to read that great stuff without any Gang War complications when we're not reading the event. Yeah. So we're going to be reading uh, issue one and two of uh, Woman Without Fear, which I'm super excited about. I've talked about Me it too. many times before that Electra is one of my favorite marvel characters and erica schultz is a fantastic writer so this should be very exciting and then we're also going to be covering the first two issues of dark knights of steel all winter uh which is another one where we couldn't read the issue one last month but then we have three polls for this week two are returning we were just talking about local man local man 13 we got more local man action which is awesome and we have ultimate spider-man number eight as well so those books we will be continuing and we have a new book we talked about it when it was announced. We talked about a lot of the teasing that led up to it. There are plenty of new segments about this book on our channel. So it's great that we're finally going to be t- talking about Wolverine Revenge, number one. Greg Capullo's return to interiors after, I want to say he hasn't done interiors for over a year now. Something like that. Like, it's been a, w- a little while since Greg Capullo's worked on interiors. So, very exciting. Hell yeah. But that's all I have to say. So unless Katie wants to hit you guys with anything else. Nope. Am I good? Then hopefully we'll see you next week, Comic Geeks.